Want to make sure you never miss a new release from the official Creepypasta.com YouTube channel again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. My Time Haunted by a Poltergeist by Avesian When I was around the age of 11, I lived with my family in Maddock, North Dakota. It's a very small town with only five streets along the main highway. It had its own school district, but that was because it was so far out in the middle of nowhere, even by North Dakotan standards. I remember my mother having to drive several miles east just to get a signal on her phone. This was back in 2009, I'm 21 now, and the things that happened in that house have haunted me since. The house was two stories high, on 303 Viking Avenue. The house has since been torn apart, but I can still feel it, like the house itself is one giant ghost, one that haunts me. It was one of the first to be built in the town, dating back about 130 years ago. I don't know the history of the house, but somehow it came to be owned by my grandmother on my mother's side. Stepping into the house was like stepping into an icebox. I do have to preface this experience with how I am not new to paranormal phenomena. I grew up in a very spiritual household, and I guess I became sort of a magnet, but nothing prepared me for this. But stepping into the house, you could feel its cold, dead grip grasp you. It left you paranoid and sleep deprived. I stopped being able to sleep in my room alone, so I had to have our large German Shepherd sleep in my bed every night with me. Every night, there used to be something in the corner of my room, watching down at me. Obviously, if I look back on it, this is exactly when my sleep paralysis started, but I like to tell myself it didn't start until I was a freshman in high school, but I know better. If the power went out, then I would start to freak out. I was afraid whatever monster sat at my bed at night would come for me in the darkness. This is how the haunting started, with the paranoia and the fear of sleeping. Then came the figures we would see at the end of the hall, then the things flying off the wall or counters, then the threat of physical violence started. We would be pushed down the stairs, sometimes it would be a subtle fall, but sometimes you could feel cold hands on your back as they pushed you, but you could always see the shadow at the end of the hall, its faceless shadow towering in the dimly lit hallway. We only lived there for about six months, and we quickly left back to the sunny coast of California. The last thing that happened to us before moving back was during the holiday season. We were all sitting in the living room, me, my mother and father, watching TV. And then, without warning, all the pictures flew off the walls. Things we had up on shelves flew from their homes, glass shattering on the other side of the room from where it belonged. Then, about two weeks later, we moved. But sometimes, I think that part of the house came with us. Haunted College Apartments by G4SO9 I was living in an apartment complex in a college town with three roommates, though there was really just two of us. The other guys were always gone back at their parents' homes or work, after a few months of living at these apartments, nothing had really happened to us. We were just normal college students, partying and doing schoolwork. But after three months, we started hearing scratching noises in the wall. We thought it was just rodents, or neighbours, or something along those lines. But then it got weird. One day, when it was just my best friend and me, we were playing Xbox in the living room. We paused and left the controller on the table in front of the couch. We also had a counter by the kitchen and a tall circular table in the corner on the other side of the room. We both go to the kitchen at the same time, and we hear the Xbox controller icon moving on the screen. The sound that the TV makes when you're scrolling was going off. We thought that was incredibly weird, but probably just the controller sticking. But when we go back in the living room, we find that the controller was now on the high top circular table. We checked the house to see if anyone was there, and didn't find anyone. We would have seen anyone walk in, because the only way in and out of the apartment is through the kitchen. That was really the first thing that happened. Next, I came home from class, and I unlocked and walked into my room, 
turned on my TV, and walked back out to talk to my best friend, who was watching golf in the living room. I put him some food for lunch, and walked back into my room, and saw something incredibly weird. There was an imprint on my bed, like someone was sitting there, but there was no one there. I reached out to try to touch it, and it was incredibly cold, but as soon as I reached out, whatever was there disappeared, and the imprint started to fade. I freaked out for a few days after this. I accused my friend of trying to scare me, but he was just as terrified as I was. He was having experiences of his own. In his experiences, the paranormal were a little more forceful. He always came in from hanging out with people around 2am, and he was going into his room when the door leading to his side of the apartment slammed shut in his face. This happened three or four times, and then stopped. He also experienced things moving on their own in his room, like pictures falling over, and posters being ripped from the walls. The scariest thing that happened was when we were watching an NBA game, and we heard a loud crash coming from his room on his side of the apartment. We were both too terrified to go back there, but I took my phone out and quickly took pictures to try to catch something on film. Nothing showed up. We both finally manned up and went into his room. Everything, and I mean everything, had been lifted up off the ground, flipped or turned around, and dropped. His bed was all over the floor, and his golf clubs were everywhere. We had no idea what to do, but we stuck it out for the last month, and then moved the heck out. I never did any research, mostly because the apartment complexes wouldn't tell us anything anyways. I set up cameras multiple times, but nothing showed up on the video. The activities were very random, so it was hard to choose the right night. The complexes weren't built on any cemeteries, but we were really just four to five hundred meters away from one. Since I've moved out, I haven't had any ghostly experiences, and neither has my ex-roommate, who moved into new apartments. Some of the Happenings in My Apartment by Miss Nunchaku I've been living with my boyfriend since late December of this year, after his father died. My boyfriend's father was his hero, got him on the straight and narrow. Unfortunately, his father had a massive heart attack and died on the scene. Now onto the experiences I've had in our studio apartment, and one at my boyfriend's childhood home. The day after the passing, I packed up a small bag and went to stay with my boyfriend and his stepmom to help them cook, clean the house, feed the pets, and get things ready for the small memorial party after the services. I was cooking breakfast for them, and I poked my head out of the kitchen to ask how they wanted their eggs. I felt something hit me on top of the head. I looked over next to me, and the package of paper towels that were sitting on top of the fridge had fallen somehow, even though they were in a little basket. I had painted on some canvases for my boyfriend's apartment, he hung up a painting I had done of Frankenstein's monster in the kitchen next to the cooktops. We had a light frame made for it, and a thumbtack held it to the wall. One night while we were asleep, we both hear a loud thud. I wake him up frantically, asking him if he heard it too. He got out of bed, flicked on the light, and saw my painting in the kitchen laying on the floor. It was completely out of the frame it was staple gun too, and the thumbtack was broken in half and sticking out of the wall. Due to Covid, I work from home, and my boyfriend works limited hours at his job. I'm home alone from about 10.30 to 6 every day. I'm sitting and doing my work, and I could swear to God, I heard the sound of something frying oil in the kitchen. I got up, and checked to see if I had left the stove on. I hadn't. I could hear the still popping noises of frying food, and it was loud as soon as I got over to the stove. I moved the pan to put it away, and the noise stopped as soon as it came. I hear this frying noise some days, a few minutes before my break for lunch at 1pm. This next experience is not at the apartment or the childhood home, but it is relevant. I went to my mum's place to stop home and get a few things. My boyfriend was out getting some food. Me and my mum started talking about the falling out between us and the stepmom. I'm telling her about the abuse that my boyfriend's father had to put up with, and that I only knew about this after his death. One time the stepmom, 
and my boyfriend's dad were vacationing together down in Louisiana. They got into an argument and she scratches his face with her nails, making him bleed. She steals his keys, wallet and phone and kicks him out of the hotel. He had to call my boyfriend on a payphone to ask for his card numbers so he could order a plane ticket home. Anyways, I was telling my mum of this very incident and we heard a thud and something skidding on our wooden floor. I got into the hallway to see one of the pictures is gone and it's on the playroom floor off its hook, having gone at least five or six feet from its original hook. I call my mum over to show her and she freaks out a little. She's a devout Catholic and she has had a lot of strange things happen in my childhood home after her brother died, but to quote her, nothing this aggressive. To clarify, I started to date my boyfriend in early October and had only met his dad a few times. He was a sweetheart of a man, loved my art, loved me, told me and his son that we were perfect together and was a welcoming person. My boyfriend told me that he would have loved for me to meet his dad more because he really did like me as a person. So I'm just wondering what this could be. Is it my boyfriend's dad? Another one of our family members? Or something that attached itself to my boyfriend or me while we were grieving, feeding off our self-destructive behaviour and stupid choices. The House That Killed Skepticism by Astral Ninja My dad gained custody of my brother and I when I was seven and my brother was four. For a while we lived in a small two bedroom house. The rooms were small and it just felt cramped. I hated sharing a room with my brother and him having access to all my stuff. So when my dad told us that our current landlord bought the much bigger three bedroom house down the road and was willing to rent it to us, I was thrilled. My dad was a prison guard and was hard working and not at home between the hours of 6am and 5pm. We had babysitters up to the point I was around 12, then none and we had to get ourselves ready for school and usually feed ourselves. This was never a problem because we knew how to cook and keep the house and we mostly had a good relationship with our dad. I will note he was an annoyingly skeptical man at this point in his life. I remember upon touring the house the first time I barely paid attention to most of it, just fought my brother for the biggest room. I stood in the middle of the room and just spun around, marvelling at all the space I would have. I had absolutely no reason to be upset, but then for some reason I just felt, well, dead inside is the only way I can describe it. I walked out and told my dad I didn't feel right. He told me it was probably because it was hot in the house. I accepted this because I did not want to think about it anymore. I just wanted to be excited for the new house. We moved a week or so later and for a while the feelings were good. For some time my room felt welcoming and cosy. I have fond memories of laying in bed wrapped in my tie-dye comforter watching Inuyasha on Adult Swim when I was supposed to be asleep. Good times. They didn't last long. Life was fine in the house for a couple of months. At most, I maybe saw a few movements out the corner of my eye, but such things are easy to dismiss. The one thing that bothered me most was the basement. It was a cave of concrete slabs, low ceilings and a deep dark storage room where we kept all of our Christmas and Halloween decorations. The main open area had our washer and dryer and a bunch of my dad's driftwood projects he sold to local pet shops for use in terrariums. The basement made me feel sick, like a deep pit of dread in my stomach that wouldn't go away until I went upstairs. Of course, laundry was my job, so I would make my trips down there as quick as I could. It started with the voices. They were quiet at first, but eventually I would be startled awake by random screams that no one else in the house seemed to hear. Heavy footsteps and banging outside my bedroom door became common. My room was at the centre of the house, off our computer room. My dad's was on one side, by the kitchen, and my brother was on the other side of the living room, so we weren't exactly close to each other. Soon after this started, however, my brother began sleeping in my dad's room so something must have bothered him too. The activity remained constant for a while, 
with things getting knocked over, noises at night, and general eerie feelings. It didn't escalate until one night when I had some friends over. I believe my dad was playing poker with the neighbours, and my friends and I were drawing and listening to music. Suddenly, one of my friends said, Wait, who's that? We all stopped to look where she was pointing. In my dad's large TV, we could see our reflections sitting around the table, but there was someone else, the vague reflection of a man sitting on the couch behind us. We were stunned, looking back and forth from the empty couch to the TV screen. My friend stood up then, and we all watched in horror as the mysterious figure on the screen turned slowly to look at her. We all screamed and ran outside. I ran down the street to get my dad to come home. He insisted we scared ourselves. As time went on, things in the house got worse. I began having episodes of paranoia and insomnia. I had always been a stubborn kid, but I became depressed and refused to get out of bed some days. I felt weak and dazed, and just not present in the room with others. As my mental state deteriorated, the spirits of the house moved closer. I began to see them. At times, a tall, shadowy slender man would creak open my bedroom door and stare at me. I would hear what sounded like a woman softly crying under my bed. There was a man with a burnt face who would hide in the dark corners of the basement. I would hear his raspy breathing before I saw him. It felt like a nightmarish Dr. Seuss book that my father refused to acknowledge. One day, I was walking through my computer room and it felt like I ran into someone's open hand, and as the fingers began to squeeze around my neck, I ran backwards and just stood, holding my neck in shock. Later, I began to cough up small amounts of blood. This concerned my dad, and he took me to the ER. The doctor shined a light down my throat, and said I had several tiny lacerations in the back of my esophagus. He asked if I accidentally ate some metal or glass. I was sure I hadn't. A couple of months after this, I woke up spitting blood again with the same cause. Then it happened to a friend of mine when she spent the night. I still don't have a proper explanation for these injuries. I feel my breaking point with this house came when I was retrieving the laundry from the basement. I was almost up the stairs when I felt a cold hand wrap around my ankle, and then I was violently yanked, screaming down the concrete stairs. This event ripped a huge patch of skin off the front of my leg, and also left my cheek and elbow bleeding. As I hit the basement floor, I heard a raspy laugh, mocking and cruel. I ran upstairs sobbing, begging my father to move, pleading with him to believe me. He simply insisted I lost my footing, and tended to my wounds. Determined to prove to him the house was haunted, I made a pair of dowsing rods. For anyone who doesn't know, Dowsing rods are bent metal rods that you hold in your hands that rotate when they come into contact with magnetic energy. They were once used to detect underground water, but more often are used to detect spirits, these days anyway. I made the rods out of pieces of cut up wire hanger and used straws to separate the metal from the skin of my hands. My dad watched, amused as I walked around our computer room with the rods. As I approached a wall shelf, that held my dad's precious moment figurines, the rods began to aggressively rotate toward me, and then move back as I stepped away. Does that mean they're full of water? My dad laughed. Shortly after this, it was as if someone swept their arm along the shelf and threw every single figurine against the wall. My dad's face dropped. I didn't end up feeling nearly as satisfied as I had hoped. After that, the spirit started stalking my dad at night. They knew he knew about them now. No point in hiding, I guess. My dad finally disclosed to me that a shadowy figure stood in the kitchen outside his room at night and watched him for hours. He couldn't sleep at night anymore and almost lost his job. We moved soon after this. As the years went by, I saw many families move in and out of this house. No one stays there for long. I had an opportunity a few years ago to tour the house as it was available for rent again. Walking from room to room, it was clear the energy was still present, dark and heavy as ever. 
I asked the landlord in the most passive way if any of the previous tenants had said anything about any activity. He was surprised by the question and informed me he had just bought the property. We ended up talking for a while and I gave him the best heads up I could. Luckily, he seemed to be more intrigued than upset. I hope he keeps that enthusiasm. I did not rent the house and have put it and its less than pleasant occupants in the past. One thing I will always be thankful for is the endurance I developed living there. I'm no longer afraid of ghosts. I've been yelled at, intimidated and hurt by them. I've seen them at their worst. So now, I am absolutely the person who investigates the sounds at night. I thrive in paranormal locations. I seek them out and enjoy them. Most spirits just want acknowledgement and understanding. Some want to pull you down the stairs. Just like people, they can't all be winners. The house helped me to be brave and face my fears. It made my dad a believer. It gave us a lot of stories to tell. So I guess I am grateful that I had the experience, even if it was ultimately unpleasant. It helped mould me into the strange person I am today.